in Jesus' name, everyone is actually so blessing everyone that is participating in, in this session tonight, as well as those who are not here as yet, those who will be here. I command every prince of darkness, every spiritual wickedness, every power, and every ruler of darkness to stand down, back off of, of the participants and those that will be here in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I decree light and life to everyone here. In Jesus' name, I, I, I command the spirit of understanding, spirit of wisdom and understanding, without any hindrance. We, in Jesus' name, we rebuke, we command all unbelief to go and do not return. Light and life in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. Amen. All right. So well, most of you should already um, be familiar with me. I don't think we have anyone new on the session. So welcome back to the, to, to the final session of Ephesians, of Ephesians um, chapter 6. I'm just reading Vanessa's comments here. Still packing on the truck too. Okay. And she just left her, right? So blessings. Okay, so before we proceed, um I'll just let's take about two minutes. Um before we proceed, I just like to open up the the, 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 the floor for two minutes for anyone to express um how the previous five chapters may have uh, as we are in the last session, you all feel free to open up your mics and express how the study of Ephesians have actually impacted you, how it may have helped you, strengthened you, reinforced you, and any testimonies as um, regarding the study that we were doing. So feel free to unmute. Oh, and now see we have a small set, a small small group here tonight. Six of us. So you all feel free to unmute and give your comments and we'll proceed. Anyone? Or at least two people. Everyone Bro, here? Bro, this is this is such a blessed class. And oh. um by by knowing the <clears throat> um the by by knowing our our uh, uh, true uh, position in the spirit, um, we are able, and when we are uh, uh, operating from the spirit, we are able to to make this this greater change in our lives. You know, and um, every um, every Christian, every a Christian uh, believer, not only every Christian believer, but those who are um, saying that they uh, actually understand their uh, identity in Christ, um, they should all hear this, you know, uh, because um, <clears throat> uh, understanding is one. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, Understanding who really understanding intellectually understanding um, uh, who you are in Christ um, that is part two. So you, uh, knowing who you are in Christ is much more than knowing with head knowledge who you are in Christ. But knowing who you are in Christ is um, knowing your identity and actually living from that identity. And, and seeing, speaking, hearing, and changing your, uh, able to change your environment because you really live from out of your identity. And that is something else as knowing your identity. It is more living your identity uh, because you renewed your mind to be conform on your spirit. Now you can um, live from... Uh, from out that that new uh, that new you that you know, and uh, those the classes we are uh, we are attending from uh, from the, the, these are um, um, classes who are 
um, the classes with great work, you know, um, with with uh, with many profound uh, knowledge, with much profound knowledge in it, and um, yeah, I love it. I just simply love it. So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome, bro. Awesome. I'm, glad, I'm really glad to hear that. I'm as you started seeing, you started seeing just now. I would just like to, to add a little bit to that in the sense that um, you were saying that it's one thing to acknowledge that you have a new identity. But you said step two. I, I think that you were you, you were more getting along the lines of step two is of of step two being taking it further from just my acknowledgement, yes I have a new identity, but step two is actually now becoming settled. Yeah, yeah I, I I sometimes uh sometimes I hear in class also, you know, when speaking about uh yeah uh, when people speak about their identity in Christ, I sense um, um, in in uh, people I sense a head knowledge, you know. But right. having a head knowledge about who you are in Christ, you can you can read ten thousand of books and and having a big head knowledge, you know, Root. full <laughs> uh, of of full of knowledge and but not knowing your true identity in Christ. So I was thinking about, uh, contemplating about that. And uh, I found out um, maybe we cannot say, maybe we should not say um, knowing who we are in Christ, but living who we are in Christ, you know? So that is more in the, in, in that direction. So I was thinking about that. And yeah, and, and those classes here as, as we, uh, we attend um, those are, are are needful you know for 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 many participants um, to live actually their identity in Christ and, and yeah um, other than knowing from head knowledge who they are in Christ because knowing only knowing who they are in Christ it doesn't change your life but living who you are in Christ, that changed your life, you know? Indeed, indeed, indeed. And that, that's actually such, that, that in particular that, that you're saying there is, um, so even though it may sound like a light matter, it is in no way a light matter because we, um, many of us walk around, as you're saying, saying that we have a new identity we are in Christ, not really, it, in, in other words, the paradigm does not change. So it's the old man with some additional information that is, is not part of his, of his paradigm, it's not part of who, who, who he knows himself to be and who he lives from. And um, wh one of the reasons why I Actually, I've, dedicated, I've put together these sessions like this in particular because I, um, I, I actually respect the fact that we have a lot of preachers in the world. People that actually speak about the kingdom, they preach about Jesus. But if you look at Acts 28, coming down the last part of Acts 28, it said Paul, the Apostle Paul, while he was in his, his own quarters, his personal quarters, he preached the kingdom of God and taught the things concerning Jesus Christ. Which means they... Hello? Yeah. Could please meet your mic, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, so it says that actually he, um, he, he preached the kingdom of God. He preached it. He heralded it. He heralded it. And he taught the things concerning Jesus Christ, which in my opinion, identifies a progression because when you actually preaching the kingdom of god you actually preaching and advertising the establishment and the existence of a new kingdom and usually when people actually advertise a country even in the in in the in the, in, in the natural world when they ad advertise a country what they do is they advertise 
the the um, the um the great features of the country, the beaches, the, the 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 houses, the quality of life, the amenities, the systems, the governmental systems that are available, that is actually advertising the country, and that I in my in, from 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 what I understand is why Jesus actually um, sent the disciples and he told them go preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse the lepers, because that what they're doing is actually identifying. Um, exemplifying, exemplifying that the kingdom that we're speaking about has no sickness. We can heal you. The kingdom that we're speaking about has no oppression. We can cleanse the leper. We can. There is no death in this kingdom. We can raise the dead. So it's it's more like an advertisement, advertising the power and the the the, the socio-economic state, also of the kingdom. And then when they come into the kingdom, you you get them to accept the new leader, the new king, as their king, then there's a great necessity to now teach about the kingdom and teach what Jesus has done. So those things, they are two separate things. And one of the things that actually have motivated me to, to, to do this in particular and to put together this information from a mechanical perspective is because we have gone to school and we have learned the mechanics of the natural science that is taught and we accept it as our truth. We accept it as that is that that is what it is. And um, I think it is at a dis it's actually putting the body of Christ at a disadvantage to think that they can actually just say, "Let's walk in faith," but they don't know what to apply their faith to. They are actually applying their faith in a lot of fogginess, in a lot of smoke, and it's like um. Similar to if you if you tell someone like a teacher, someone who has no knowledge of automobiles or vehicles as a mechanic, and you tell someone that, that is a teacher has never had contact with that field in any form or fashion, and you tell him that he's a mechanic, and he walks around confessing, I'm a mechanic, I'm a mechanic, I'm a mechanic. When something goes wrong with a vehicle, he will panic. That's because he simply does not understand the mechanics of the engine. And in Christ, I really think that it is the body has to actually come to the understanding that for people to be settled, we have to identify the mechanics of the kingdom, the mechanics of Christ in you. And once you can identify the mechanics, the paradigm shifts a lot easier. Confessions are good, but the confessions must be fortified with a mechanical, a mechanical understanding of what we are engaged in. Does that make sense, everyone? Any any comments? Any comments at all? Feel free to unmute and and, and comment before we proceed. Yes, yeah, Zane. I actually had to leave for a few minutes yet to, um, to see about my dog. Actually, he went here. He actually ran out from the yard and went in the road. So I'm going to bring him back. So you could just um, go over what you just explained there, please. Sorry about that. Oh, well, actually, what I was just explaining, I was responding to a, a comment that Elijah um, made and what, we were, what was actually... I was just building up on what he said in the sense he said that there's one thing to have a head knowledge of the fact that um, that you have a new identity in Christ and, and all things are made new, but it's another thing to begin to walk it out. So I was just building up on it, expect to identify that, um, briefly identifying that we have preachers in the world, but we also need teachers and we also want, need to understand for paradigms to shift. I, simp I use a, an, an analogy, much like um, uh, someone like you take someone from a particular profession and you could try to get them engaged into a particular profession. What's taking place in the body of Christ a lot is that you might take, for example, as I said, just now a teacher and you, to, you, you approach a teacher and you say, actually, you know, Jesus has actually made you a mechanic. And in the body, what has taken place, in the body what has taken place is actually um, the fact that, that a lot of people accept this and uh, they have a lot of of the uh, scenes in general. They walk around with confessions. Um, I'm the, so the person, this this teacher, 
they receive they receive this information. They say I'm a mechanic, and they walk around saying I'm a mechanic a thousand times. But if there's a, a, a mechanical problem, that teacher panics. That's simply because they are they are they are not they have no mechanical knowledge, and so the body of Christ, the body of Christ must come to the realization that they, they have to give some time and effort to the, the understanding of the mechanics of the kingdom as well as, as well as the mechanics of Christ in you. And that easily causes the, the paradigm to shift for people to actually now walk into it and apply it practically. That is, that is technically what I would say. All right, bro. Thanks very much. I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. Alright, so last call for comments before we proceed. Anyone would like to see how this how these, these sessions have actually impacted them? Uh qu question. Pardon? So uh -huh. when we reach that when we reach that stage and the paradigm shifts as you say, we I guess at their point are fully aware. I mean we know that we are children of God, but when when you re get to that point, that's when we're going to start to operate the way Jesus and the early and, and the apostles and the people today are operating with signs and wonders and et cetera, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that, that's going to come by, by reading scripture. Not not only, well, reading scripture is one thing, but one of the um, greater, one of the, one of the greater impediments that are, that, that exists in the body of Christ in particular is that we actually, there was um, historically speaking, and we cannot need, we cannot actually turn our blind eye to because it's very, very important. It's extremely important. We we have done, we have to actually take into consideration that that um, we in the in the Western in the Western world, yes, we we in the, we in the Western world in particular, um, our. Um, method of understanding certain things is actually completely different from the Eastern understanding of certain things. It, we cannot actually, um, one of the, the huge, one of the biggest, the biggest obstacles to understanding scripture is the fact that we have to understand that this, these scriptures actually come from um, Israel, the Jews. And these Jews, their schooling, their school structure, their culture in general was actually surrounding the, the Torah as well as the prophets and sacred writings. They had their own customs and their own traditions. And so we read about the disciples, we read about the apostles and the way they moved, the way they operated in power. But we don't have the foundational understanding that they have. So, for example, we read about how actually, um, for example, a good example is how the disciples actually went about healing. We know that Jesus said, go forth and heal the sick. But if you really understand the approach to healing, you realize that they walk around and they address evil spirits, not as evil spirits, they say unclean spirits. And that's because... If once they identify themselves as unclean, indirectly what they're saying is that I am clean. That actually is rooted in the law, in the Torah, which is actually the, um, the differentiation, the massive differentiation between all things that are clean and unclean. So if, if one doesn't actually understand the culture and what the, 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 the culture is actually structured on, then we can we can read the scripture for 50 years and simply not get it because jesus was a was a circumcised jew so he was i mean in israel um in israel basically when you were born you were circumcised on the eighth day and from age six you were started in, in school and that school actually uh, if you are familiar with this the the first the, the schooling system in Israel is actually divided into three, and and, and that schooling system still exists to a particular tent up to today in Israel. You went to school from ages six to ten to learn the Torah, and that and that actually is actually referred to as Bet Sefer. It still exists. 
you go and you memorize the Torah of Genesis to Deuteronomy, word for word in Hebrew. After that, from 10 to 14, you go into, if I'm not mistaken, what you refer to as Bet Talmud, where if you did well in the first and you put, if you can, if you decided to proceed um, into study, you go now and you memorize all the prophets. You, you were taught the prophets. You had to memorize the prophets, all, the, all, 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 um, all of the prophets. If you didn't continue, you go and you do a trade. So if you drop out of the school system, the school system you do a trade. Um, after 10 to 14, you're going to, if I'm not mistaken, it's referred to as Bet Midrash, which is now you actually going to look for a rabbi to study under so that you one day can become a rabbi. So we see Jesus actually walking around, um, looking at, 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 at fishermen. And we say, okay, there's fishermen, but if you understand this, the culture, you realize that these fishermen, they studied the Torah and they didn't continue. So they, had no, they didn't actually have a very strong foundation in the prophets. This is why Jesus would walk around and Jesus, when he's actually speaking in the, in the synagogue and things like that, Jesus himself, was a carpenter so when he's speaking in and his work he's speaking he's teaching and he's healing there's a the pharisees are frequently asking him under what authority are you doing this because he himself did not complete the entire schooling system nor did all of the disciples is, is this making sense fantastic yes thank you yeah so it's it's actually just to read the scripture, but a great portion of it is actually see it through the eyes of the Jews. And once you see it through the eyes of the Jews, everything falls into perspective. And then it's now um, understandable. Another good example, excellent example of the difference in their understanding and our understanding is understanding of spirit. Now we understand a spirit and when we think of a spirit, we think of something that is ethereal, something that has some invisible body that is actually walking around and comes into, into comes and enters into beings or into human beings but if you look at on the understanding of spirit in their understanding spirit is wind and breath so, so notice that in ezekiel 37 he actually sees the dry bones and he commands the winds the word for wind and spirit is what it's actually the same thing one in the same so simple things like these could actually be a big obstacle in understanding how Jesus, um, what Jesus' perspective was, and um, how and the, the perspective that he used to actually do what he was what he was doing. So coming back again to that is after the mechanical understanding, because Jesus didn't just receive the Holy Spirit, boom, and just miraculously just worked out he had a foundation on the standing of the scriptures to be able to apply it all right so all right so any other comments or questions i i hope that is helpful to you it was was that mr allen alan yeah, yes sir I, I appreciate that brother so much thank you okay no problem no problem all right so as i was saying this is the final installment of, of ephesians chapter six so without further ado let's get into it Aunt Adrian is now here, so she would, as per usual, she would be um, posting. We had some technical difficulties with respect to the the the, um, the manual that we were working with here today. So she's actually was up, um, the the version of the manual that she has today might be a little more complicated. So if you see there's some delays, we kindly ask her to have some patience with us there. All right. All right, so we're back into Ephesians chapter 6. Let's get into it. All right, so verse 1. Could anyone read verse 1 for me, please? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. For this is right, for obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. Thank you very much, my dear Holy Brother and cousin. All right, so it says, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. What does it mean to obey? When we say obey here, what does it mean to obey even according to the law of Moses? What, what does the word obey mean?
Come on, guys, obey. Okay, feel free to unmute and give your contribution. All right. What does it mean to obey? Hello. To, to do as ordered, of course. Oh. Oh. Nice, John. Nice. <laughs> I see you're working with the dictionary. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, so to do as ordered by a person, act according to the bidding of, to do as one is told. All right. So we also have, um, according to the, to the, to Paul's understanding of obey, would also be to refer to um, following directives or guidelines. All right. Which is the same thing to be obedient or to compliant and to be compliant. So the definition of obey here is to follow the commands of or guidance of, in this case, as it relates to the context of the of the old covenant, because he's actually quoting this from the laws, children obey your parents in the Lord, and to obey there was actually to hear and act. So follow the, the commands or guidance of, and as John just put, to conform, to be compliant. Right. So we say. Um, follow the commands or the guidance of your parents in the Lord. That is accepting their guidance and discipline. And I don't think we need to break down what guidance is. So you can say guidance is actually um, help or the advice in, in directing you as to what to do. Or uh, the act or, or processing of guiding someone or teaching someone. That's guidance. And discipline. What does it mean to be disciplined? What is discipline? And then we'll apply that to self-discipline. Keeping your body in subjection. Keeping your body in subjection. Okay. That's that's an aspect of discipline, but give me holistically what discipline would be in itself. Anyone? Discipline. Right. So you see, we have a very quiet group here today. Discipline. What does it mean to be disciplined? All right. Auntie, you go ahead and pose the definition there for us, please. All right. the, the discipline here is actually training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. Let me say that again. Training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character, which automatically pulls into context what Paul means when he says and obey your parents and um, that is accepting their guidance and discipline because what the parents are actually doing is giving them rules or um, orders, a structure to work with to bring their moral character as well as their mental faculties into governance. Pretty much of the, the, the role of the, the, the role of the parent is to bring the child into self-governance. Right? So self-discipline here would be the ability to make yourself do things that should be done, which would require training, this um, a, a, a structure that is put in place to encourage orderly behavior, um, orderly behavior. No problem, John. No problem at all. All right. Um, verse two. Verse two. Would anyone read verse two for us, please? It says honor. Is, well, I, actually, I read verse two. It says honor, esteem, value as precious your father and your mother, and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise. Right? What does it mean to honor? We just want to be very clear with respect to the context here. Honor, esteem. Thank you, John. Esteem, value as precious your father and mother, and be respectful to them. So there we have some answers there. Esteem and value as precious, but to honor, what, what, what? How do you honor someone? What is another way of saying honor? Respect, yes. All right, so that's that's also there. Recognition of importance or value, yes. Also veneration, actually showing them admiration. So. Um, children are actually required to show them admiration as well give special recognition to. Verse 3 
Okay, no problem, Auntie. All right, so verse 3. Verse 3 says, here we are. So, uh, so that it may be well with you and that you may have a long life on the earth. All right. Thank you very, thank you very much, John. Right, so when we say, so that it be well with you and that you may have a long life on the earth, now, notice that actually Paul is actually quoting this from the, this is actually coming straight out of the first Ten Commandments that they received. Now, we know that we are not living under the law. So when Paul is quoting this, in what context is Paul quoting this? Think about it. If Paul, if, if we know that we are not living under the law, we are not bound by the ordinances of the law, and Paul is actually using this and quoting it here, in what context do you think he's quoting it? completely fully new covenant so in when we say new covenant in what what in what context are you referring to in particular so the old covenant is actually obedience by commandments and the new covenant what do we live like by throughout one of the previous sessions we actually spoke about what what replaced the law in the new covenant what in particular replaced the law in the new covenant does anyone remember that holy spirit um, what aspect of the Holy Spirit replaces the love? Yeah, but there's a particular aspect. So let's go back to, to faith. All of that is correct, but there's something in particular that guides us now. Um, this is one of the reasons why we reason the scriptures as we've been doing. So let's go back to, to Genesis. So you come come to an understanding. Um King Solomon spoke, King Solomon speaks about it a lot. The entire book of Proverbs is actually dedicated to that. What is that? Wisdom, exactly. Wisdom. The reason why the law came into, into being is because, remember, when Adam chose, King Solomon said in the book of Wisdom that the beginning of um, wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and with God is wisdom. So when Adam chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what Adam did was chose was choose knowledge without wisdom. Does that make sense? You all remember that? If God, if it God is wisdom, then choosing the tree of knowledge of good and evil was having was choosing knowledge without wisdom. Yeah, and we understand wisdom we understood wisdom to be the ability to apply knowledge knowledge is what we refer to as information um for the accumulation of facts and understanding is what we understand in our modern english as reasoning or understanding or comprehending the mechanics so when um adam chose the true tree, tree chose the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he chose knowledge without wisdom, which we know in our common modern English as intelligence. So Adam was fallen Adam, they fill themselves with information, but do not have the intelligence to apply it to understand it from the kingdom's perspective. So when Paul actually quotes from the law, he's not actually quoting from the obedience from the perspective of, of, of obedience to commandments, he's quoting from the perspective of wisdom and wisdom pretty much is governed by the raw, the law of sowing and reaping isn't that so what you sow you reap everybody following that does that make sense we covered this in the first two chapters of ephesians yeah so when paul is actually referring to this here now he's actually saying if you sow as children, you sow badly, corruptly into your parents, you will reap it. And the reward, reap the fruit of sowing negatively into your parents is actually a short life. Make sense? This is all sowing and reaping. God is not punishing you. You sow darkness, you will reap darkness. 
All right, so we can re pretty much recognize that we can adequately ca categorize the purpose of Paul's reference into two categories here. The law, as we said, the law serves to educate us on the principles of the personality of Christ also. So this is why um, Paul was actually able to explain Christ to most people because his knowledge of the law and understanding that the law of Moses, the Torah, was actually an, a description of what the character of Jesus is. He does not steal. He does not disrespect his parents. He does not kill. He does not commit adultery. Right? He wouldn't see his neighbor's ox in the road and leave it alone. He shows love. Right? And in the absence of penalties, we have the law of sowing and reaping. Remember in Galatians, Paul said, that actually God says that God is, um, Paul said that God is not mocked whatever we sow. Thank you very much, Hansi. It says God is not mocked that he who sows to the flesh will have the flesh with corruption and he who sows to the spirit will have the spirit repeat in a life. So if you sow darkness, is God doing you anything? Is God punishing you? No, he is not. You are simply reaping what you have planted. So in wisdom and in intelligence, we will do well to choose the seeds that we plant. Everybody following that? Excellent. Nice. So verse 4. Thank you, Auntie. Verse 4. Anyone like to read verse 4 for me, please? Anybody? Just unmute and read verse 4. It's in the chat window. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness and discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right. Thank you very much, my holy brother. So it says, fathers do not provoke. What is to provoke, guys? When we provoke someone, what do we do? No problem, Courtney. Blessings. Much blessings. Be enveloped in the light of the Father through the rest of your work time and evening. How do, how do we provoke, guys? Exactly. We incite someone to anger. We stir them to anger. Provocation is actually deliberately stirring them to anger. So here we have a definition here. To incite to anger, to stir up purpose, purposely, and to cause a person or animal to become angry, violent, etc. Right? It's to exasperate is a synonym of provoke. Um, also, it means... Um, sorry. It also says, do not exasperate to the point of resentment. The demands, we covered all of those things in previous sessions, which are trivial or unreasonable, humiliating or abusive. Nor by showing favoritism or indifference. So favoritism would be to show, to be biased. What is to, to, what is to actually be indifferent? Paul is actually identifying a few things here that parents need to take into consideration when they are actually dealing with children. He says, do not provoke them, incite them to anger, which means you are deliberately trying to in, um, stir them up or get them angry, which would be as a result of probably um, being vindictive. And he also says, do not show favoritism amongst your children and do not be indifferent. What, what, how, 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 how is one indifferent? What, is, what does it mean to be indifferent? What does it mean to be indifferent? Come on. Anyone? All right, Auntie, definition for indifferent there, please. So indifferent here means marked by impartiality. Not like the rest. Um, technically, yes, John. So when we are actually indifferent, you are unbiased, yes, but we can also, as parents, none. Alan is saying none, none what? You can write, write if, if there's, maybe. Nonplussed. 
Okay, okay. I couldn't uh, find my mute button. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Yes, so that actually refers to Mark by um, not um, being biased, but also as a parent, we can actually show like what they do doesn't really matter. There is no inclination to positivity or negativity. Like it, what what you do, it's it's insignificant. So th there are some recommendations there from Paul. All right, he also says. He also says um, to treat them tenderly with love and kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So he says that discipline is basically is control, control or bringing them into pretty much self-governance. That is gained by requiring rules or orders to be obeyed and also punishing bad behaviors. So you teach them pretty much how to govern themselves. This is what a parent pretty much does. The parent, as we covered in the previous session, governs his own soul, disciplines his own soul, and by disciplining his soul, he can also discipline the child, the soul of the child. Right? And instruction there would be directives, giving them information as to how to go about doing certain things. Verse five. We are moving at a particular pace here. Nice, nice rhythm. We're moving at here. I will read verse 5. It says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters with respect for authority and with a sincere heart, seeking to please them as service to Christ. Note he says, as service to Christ. Why does he say as service to Christ? Why, why do you think he's referring to service to Christ here? Why, why does he say as service to Christ? What relevance does that have to with respect to what he's saying? What relevance does as service to Christ ha have that Christ is owning us? Yes, but it goes a little further than that. Christ is in us. So, so the masters will get the best from them. Excellent. But in what, what, why does he say as service to Christ? All right. Do you remember in the book of Revelation, it's one of the angels in Revelation said, the kingdoms of our Lord have become what? It says the kingdoms of our Lord have become what? One of the angels said that in Revelation. Anybody familiar with that scripture? With that passage? Of his Christ. It says the kingdoms of, of this world have become the kingdoms of his Christ, of, our, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we actually operate with other people, whether it be um, especially when you're dealing with saints, the kingdom, Christ actually reconciled the earth to heaven. So the earth is now his kingdom. So whatever you do in the kingdom, there is one king, which means ill-treating someone is not ill-treating the, the person alone. You are actually, it will be considered a state of fear because the, the Lord, the, Jesus Christ is the Lord. And Lord means what? What does the term Lord mean? When we say he is Lord, what does that mean? He is Christ. But what does the word Lord mean? What does that refer to? When you say he is my Lord, he is the leader, yes. But Lord in particular refers to someone that... What does that person do? Hint. Landlord. What does a landlord do? What is a landlord? Why do, why do you refer him to as the landlord? He's the lord of the land. What does that mean exactly? He's the authority over the land. Yes, he is the owner of the land. To be more specific, the word lord means owner. So when we say Jesus is lord, we, what we are literally saying is Jesus is the owner of everything. So this is the reason why Paul actually includes our service to Christ. Because Jesus is the owner. Everyone here, whether they believe it or not, actually has to bow. Those who may not have accepted Jesus and those who are have accepted Jesus. It is one Lord, whether they like to believe it or not. Jesus is the owner of everything. So as saints in particular, we treat everyone with great respect and we treat him, we treat everyone as if we treat Jesus. Because Jesus is the owner. 
So especially with regarding to saints, you notice that in the Bible, Paul constantly emphasizes that you love your brothers in Christ because the same Lord is in that person. And you may actually be treated, if you ill-treat your brother in Christ, Christ is in that person, you are ill-treating Christ himself. So you ought to treat them. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, we see no man, no longer we do we see anyone after the flesh, but we see them according to the Spirit. Make sense? Excellent. So who, who is the owner here? When we say, Lord, what are we saying? Everything here belongs to one person, and that's Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the owner, Jesus, Jesus, the owner. That's what Lord means. Keep that, always keep that in mind. When we say Lord Jesus, we actually refer to him as the owner of all of the earth and all of creation. Um, also, it says, servants, be obedient. Um, just before we move on to the next verse, to those who are earthly matters respect to, for authority and with a sincere heart seeking to please them as service to Christ. The King James Version says singleness of heart. Now the word singleness in the Greek is actually the Greek word haplotis. It also means sincerity. I just want to emphasize here the, syn the synonym that is actually being used. Singleness of heart also means sincerity as well as generosity, without dissimulation or self-seeking. Now this is very important for us in Christ, as in Christ, whether we actually have masters or not, earthly masters or not, like in, we don't have masters and slaves in, in this era of, our, of, of the civilization. Um, I, I, not really. Um, but what I would like to emphasize here is what it means to be single in heart. What, why do you think that sincerity is a synonym to being single in heart? Singleness in heart. Explain that to me. This is extremely important for the saints. One of the, mass, one of the major reasons why saints actually um, have problems manifesting supernatural power is because of this right here a lack of sincerity which is a lack of singleness in heart since generally don't live according to their hearts which is actually i i would actually um incriminate the religious mindset for that because the religious mindset is not one that preaches or teaches that one live from the heart so if for example you are having a negative experience you're being oppressed religion pretty much teaches you to be silent and to show love and not be sincere does that make sense singleness of heart actually means walking from your heart straight if you see oppression you you deal with it you do not try to compromise Religion teaches compromise a lot. Not to bash the religious folks, but the, the religious system is a system that preaches compromise. Yes, Alan. To be, to be not single in heart is to be double-minded, to be double in heart. Lack of singleness results in double mind. Yes, yes. Do you know that that is actually one of the major contributing factors to a saint not being able to identify to not be able to identify when the holy spirit is speaking to him because the saint the saint the christian let me say the christian in this case the christian that is accustomed not being sincere not living from the sincerity of their heart not being true to themselves is a Christian that actually uses reasons to not be true to themselves. Where does the Holy Spirit speak to us? Uh, Zin. Uh -huh. If you, if I may, right? <clears throat> can I just give my my personal experience? So I'm not sure if anybody else could actually get a better understanding as to what it means. Because me talking from me talking from um, 
the past religious perspective in terms of you hear that singleness, you hear sincerity, and you hear all these nice words, but you can't put it into perspective because one, you don't understand the mechanics as well as the meaning of the word. Right. Right? So if uh if if you don't mind, just can I, can I explain my um experience? No problem, proceed. Yeah. Well, something simple like um just the other night, right? I was sharing this with Zane that my wife asked me if I wanted bake or dumplings, right? And in me being out of naturally good thinking, I want to make it easy on her, right? So I'm asking her, I said, babe, what will be easier for you to make the dumplings or to make the bake? She said, that's not what I ask you. I ask you, what do you want? And I'm saying, babe, I want what you want. What, what, what will be easier for you? And she said, Mark, just tell me what it is you want. And the Holy Spirit told me, Mark, just say, just say what you naturally desire. What initially each person have an initial desire in their heart from the get-go. And that's what I stopped and I focused on. Mark, what do you want? And I know out of everything, I want oven bake. So I said, all right, babe, I will take the oven bake. She said, all right, good, I will do the oven. I said, no, what do you want to do? Which one will be easier for you? <laughs> and she said, well, okay, the oven bake will be easier for me. I said, well, right, we square off there. And so I'm not sure if that will bring light as to how it's not just being sincere with other people, but sincere to yourself. That will constitute the single-mindedness. Making sense in? Hello? Yes, it, yes, it does make sense. Yeah. Just had, just had to admit that. All right, so um, coming back to what we were saying, Mark actually drew, a, drew an example. And generally, generally, um, because of culture and because of our probably religious backgrounds, this is a struggle for a lot of people. They are not single in heart. They're frequently double-minded. It's unfortunately the lifestyle of being double-minded works against um works against works against us spiritually is this making sense to everyone we are frequently double-minded in our daily lives and when we have when we are double-minded technically what we what happens what is the double mind is your heart Sincerely, you never express what you feel sincerely. There is always a reason to not express what you feel sincerely. And now when we actually have to walk with the Holy Spirit, it is actually walking from our heart to understand the promptings and the blowings, the, the leadings of the Holy Spirit. It becomes, especially for the person who has come out from a religious background, it's taxing. It's very difficult for them to understand when the Holy Spirit is speaking, because their lifestyle is one of insincerity, it's one of double mindedness, it's one of compromise, it's one of not being true to yourself at all times. Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. So, I just wanted to actually identify that um, and before we move along. So, it's very important that in our daily lives, since I cannot emphasize, even from my own personal experience, I cannot emphasize the necessity. To be true to yourself at all times when when you when you may encounter crises and you are live a lifestyle that you're not true to yourself and true to others true to yourself with respect to your feelings how something impacts you if you live a lifestyle that is not true to yourself when the crises arise you will not be able you will actually find it extremely difficult to know what god is saying and when and what, where he is guiding you, because your mind is always involved. You're not living from the spirit. Everybody following that? <laughs> yes, Alan. <laughs> All, right. All right. So verse six and seven. Verse six and seven. Did anyone, someone on mute? And go to verse six and seven to me, please. Yes. Yeah. Not in the way of eye service, 
working only with someone is uh, with someone's watching you and only to please men, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, uh, rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not only to men. Amen. Thank you very much, my holy brother. So again, that is exactly what he's saying. To actually do service unto men is actually to act in, contra in contradiction to what your heart is saying. The reason why someone actually does something in the eye, as an eye pleaser to eye service or to please men is because uh, automatically we understand that in their heart they don't want to do it. That is being double-minded. Is, is this making sense to anyone? Feel, feel free to unmute and actually express if this is, is if, if this is actually resonating with you. It is a it is an aspect of your Christian life that you must address to be able to actually walk undoubtedly in the spirit. Does this make sense? Um, feel free to unmute and and, and, and comment what we're saying here. Or in this, or actually in the sense of are there people here that have actually been struggling with that and is, is this making sense? We have a very quiet session here today. Anyway. Anybody, anybody, anybody that does, does this resonate with you? Does this makes sense to you. Hello, everyone here. I see Kelly responds, Mark responded. Anybody else? Is this resonating? All right. Excellent. All right. So we also saw the definition of goodwill there. It is actually service with goodwill as to the Lord and not only to men. Definition of goodwill, kind, helpful, or friendly feeling or attitude. So this is actually how we are to treat all men in Christ. Allow the spirit. If we actually put outside our minds, you'd realize that when situations arise, there is a natural innate desire in you. To be kind, to be helpful, to be friendly to people. Does that make sense? In Christ, we literally actually have to look for reasons to not do it. That's because we have the new spirit, the new spirit of Christ. It is the innate behavior of saints to want to help. If you're true to yourself, you'd realize that you always want to help somebody who is actually in oppression or who is in who needs assistance everybody following that yes alan that's the fruits of the spirit yeah that that actually is your that i can you can say is your inherent desires fruits of your spirit are your inherent it's it's, it's your nature your in your inherent expression in christ all seeds hearing this right now can actually attest to the fact that where they have not been helpful is because they made a decision not to. But naturally, it is there. That's because you have the new spirit, the spirit of Christ. So verse 8 and 9. We're speeding through the first eight, first nine verses here because we've covered a lot of this already. Most of the time I'm going to spend here tonight on the arm of God, which is, I hope is useful to most of us here today. Verse 8 and 9. Could anyone unmute and read verse 8 and 9 for me, please? Knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive this back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. You masters do the same, showing goodwill toward them, and give up threatening and abusive words, showing, uh, knowing that he who is both their true master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him, regardless of one's earthly status. Thank you very much, my holy sister. So that actually is a uh, uh, confirmation of what of what he said earlier on. We actually he's saying this because all everyone here, whether they like to acknowledge it or not, must bow to the King of all creation, and that is Jesus. So you want to ensure that your actions are in homage and in respect to the king at all times. 
for masters and slaves. Nice. So now we move into now we move into the armor. So I will ask. Can I kindly ask? Let's see. John, are you there? Could you read the armor of God from verse ten to seven verses ten to seventeen for me, please? Yeah, ten through seventeen? Yes, please. Okay. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, and be empowered through your union with him, and in the power of his boundless might. Put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed, a heavily armed soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and all and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything, that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, an upright heart, and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Blessings. Now, uh, this this is actually part of the session here, which will be a little more, we will actually be going into this in detail here. So, my first question. How many of us have actually have been taught the armor of God? from a defensive perspective. But then again, how many of us have been taught the armor of God as a means of defense and protection? All right. Th this here would actually, this is actually one of the topics that is going to, an offense as well. All right. Now, how many of us actually know that the armor of God is not meant to protect you. <laughs> All right. Well, Alan says what? <laughs> I'm saying that again, John. How many of us are? How many of us know here that the armor of God, in contrast to what you have been taught, in contrast to what you've been taught, we've been taught by majority by the popular church doctrines that the armor of God is to protect us from the enemy. However, to come to a better understanding as to the context of the scripture that we're looking at, we first need to identify where Paul is quoting this from. Remember, as I was just refer, um, explaining to, to in response to Alan's question early on, that we read the scriptures, we read Paul's letters, but we do not take into consideration um, very, very frequently that Paul, and as well as all of the disciples, 
much like an American or an English person speaks from their cultural expression and their dialect, their local parlance, their twang. The apostles and the disciples speak from the knowledge of the law, the Torah, and the prophets as their culture, their paradigm, their, their, um, their dialect, their parlance, and their twang. So, <laughs> so um, I was laughing in response to Mark's, Mark's comment there. So, is anyone familiar with the fact that the that the armor of God is actually taken from the from the scriptures? When I say scriptures, referring to what we know as the Tanakh, what we know in our Bible as the Old Testament. Does anyone know that Paul is actually quoting this? From the Old Testament. Anybody familiar with that? Anybody else? Walking into Greece says no. Anybody else? When you us know that this is actually not a creation of Paul, it is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. Paul didn't come up, come up, come up with this on his own. All right. So, Auntie Dejan, I'm going to ask you to assist me here as we read here. Right, this is actually taken from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 9 to 21. So, we would to come into understanding, I'm saying this again, to understand the context in which Paul is actually coming from fully. We need to actually take a look at the context of where it comes from. So, we are going across into Isaiah 59, verses 9 to 21. Now, before we start to read, the armor of God here is actually simply an analogy that the Apostle Paul is using. Many take it to be literal also. And so for the sake of both perspectives, I'm going to look at it. We're going to look at it from the analogical perspective as well as from the literal perspective. All right, so Auntie Didrian, can you start reading that there for me, please? We're reading from verses 9 to 21, and I will tell you, well, actually, you would see where to pause. Uh, a confession of wickedness. Right. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We expectantly hope for light, but only see darkness. We hope for gleam of light, but we walk in darkness and gloom. We grope for a war like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday, as in the twilight. Among those who are healthy, we are like dead men. We all groan and growl like bears and coo sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, O Lord, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know and recognize our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, rebelling against and denying the Lord, turning away from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and muttering from the heart lying words. Justice is pushed back and righteousness and righteous behavior stands far away. For truth has fallen in the city square and integrity cannot enter. Yes, truth is missing. And he who turns away from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and was amazed that there was no one to intercede on behalf of truth and right. Therefore his own arm brought salvation to him and his own justice uh, and, and his own righteousness sustained him for the Lord put on righteousness like a coat of armor no no so far so far what we're seeing here is that it says it says here that the Lord saw that there was no man and was amazed that there was no one to intercede on behalf of truth and right. Meaning that there is oppression and there is nobody standing up. Mm -hmm. Therefore his 
own arm brought salvation to him and his own righteousness sustained him for the Lord put on righteous like a coat of armor so according to the what is the context of the armor of God here is it for defense or is it offense is it for protection or is it to actually issue righteousness execute righteousness okay, the question again what is the context of the of the court or the armor of god here is the armor for defense is it for protection or is it to execute righteousness and actually what is the armor according to verse 17 it says for the lord put on righteousness like a coat of armor so the coat of armor here or the armor of god is what righteousness standing for righteousness everybody seeing that this group is very quiet tonight boy is everybody seeing this it is for the execution of righteousness hello just if, if everybody's hearing me the responses are few here boy anyone anyone or oh, am i not seeing oh sorry sorry that was actually my bad the messages are now now actually coming in i'm sorry about that <laughs> that's my skype sorry about that my apologies right so we see here that it's to execute righteousness <laughs> execute righteousness and anti go on again go on again for me please and pause where you see pause as their deeds deserve so he will repay wrath to his adversaries retribution wait, wait actually you skipped you skipped verse 17 you pause in verse 17 just continue from verse 17 after after you see um pause for, um for he 17 wasn't for he the lord put on righteousness like a coat of armor it says for he the lord put on righteousness like a coat of armor and goes on to say and salvation like a helmet on his head oh i missed that yeah <laughs> Okay, sorry. Yeah. No problem. All right, so continue. Yeah, continue and just pause or you see pause. Salvation. Ah, okay. Let me cover this side. All right. Um, did I put up? Did I paste? All right, I'm pasting again. As the deeds deserve, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries retribution to his enemies what, to the was I auntie you you still you still miss with 17. okay wait a minute let me check yeah. it yeah you're starting from verse 18 go back to verse 17. oh okay yeah for he for he the lord put on righteousness like a coat of armor and salvation like a helmet on his head he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. All right, so let's pause there for me. Yeah. So, so here we see that the here we see the armor of God and the helmet of salvation. Everybody seeing that? Everybody seeing that helmet of salvation? And he puts on the garments, which is the armor of vengeance for clothing. So again, is this to protect you? Or is this to actually aggress the devil? Is it to aggress darkness? It is to attack. I will explain why the armor is not to protect you as we move along. Yes, yes, Alan, just like today. So the popular church doctrine is actually teaching this from a defensive perspective and is actually, in my opinion, crippling the body of Christ. Because the context of the armor is attack, to search out the enemy, search and destroy, not to defend yourself. We will explain what protects you as we move along. All right, so this is here for the execution of vengeance. The last line, Ante, of verse 17. And covered himself with zeal and great love for his people as a cloak. So again, 
is this armor within the context of self-protection from the enemy. This actually speaks about zeal, not protect yourself from Satan. I want to say this openly and clearly. The religious may find it, may find it heretic to say this, but in Christ, Satan is not your enemy. Satan is not a formidable enemy. In Christ, he is a subordinate. He is beneath you. You do not have to protect yourself from him. He needs to protect himself from you as best as he could, if he could. But Jesus actually stripped them of all, he actually stripped them of all their, of, of all their, of, of, of their power. So you actually, the saints, according to the context of the scripture, the saints on the earth are supposed to be in search and destroy missions, not in church trying to protect themselves from Satan. Does that make sense? Is making sense all right so in it is in the context of zeal zeal to show love and compassion to others in oppression this is what we do when we go and we look for people that are sick heal the sick raise the dead cast out devils this is what we do we go out there with zeal to establish righteousness in jesus's kingdom he has won the war we are to we are to quell and to stamp out the rebellions of the demonic realm of Satan and demons. All right, Second Timothy one one ten says that death is abolished and righteous um death is abolished and life and immortality has been decreed. Heal the oppressed, yes, free the captives. All right, and so you can read from verse from eighteen to verse twenty one now, please. As their deeds deserve, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries, retribution to his enemies. To the islands and coastlands he will repay. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come in like a narrow rushing stream which the breath of the Lord drives, overwhelming the enemy. A redeemer, messiah, will come to Zion and to those in Jacob, Israel, who turn from transgression, sin, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, write in the law of God on the heart, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouths of your true spiritual children, nor from the mouth of your children's children, says the Lord, from now and forever. Thank you very much. Blessings. Amen. So, before we know, now as we have established the context of the armor of God, now let's take it in pieces. All right? So we'll take it verse by verse and actually show you what is the context of the armor in itself. Everybody following so far. So everybody, it is clearly established. Is anyone is anyone double-minded about the armor being offensive and not and not defensive? Great. All right. So let's take it in stride. So it starts in verse ten. I read verse ten. It says, "In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Draw your strength from Him and be empowered through your union with Him, and in the power of His boundless might." Question: When it says, "Be strong in the Lord," what does that mean? What does it mean to be strong in the Lord? What does that mean? What does it mean to be strong in the Lord? Find your strength in God. Uh huh. Anybody else? Be strong in the Lord. What 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 do, what do you understand by be strong in the Lord? We're going to break that down, and you might find you may find it very insightful. And in contrast to what the popular church understanding is, church doctrine is. John says, find your strength in God. Anybody else? What does be strong in the Lord mean to you? Do all things through Christ. Confident, immovable. All right. So the word strong in the Lord there is actually the Greek word. And the John, you can go ahead and post that. Endunamo. Endunamo. Yeah? It means to empower. So we can read that. Be empowered in the Lord. That is 
word, the Greek word in doom in in dunamo. Yes, yes, Alan. It comes. It is actually a variation of the Greek word dunamis, that means miraculous power. So, if we read it in this context, it would read, in conclusion, be charged with miraculous power. Woo. I just say that and I'm going to pause reads. <laughs> just to understand what it actually means. It means to be charged with miraculous power. Everybody understanding that? Be empowered means to be filled with dunamis. Everybody seeing that? Come on, guys. Don't be, don't be quiet. We're breaking this down. We're dissecting it and reasoning it. Yes. Yes, um, Alan. Yes, John. <laughs> it says to be charged. So my question to you now, based on this simple understanding here, is the saint supposed to walk on the road not healing the sick? not raising the dead, not casting out devils, and trying to win people to Christ by doctrinal disputes. No, a resounding no. If you're doing that, you are, you are actually negating the armor. Yes, Alan, even begging God to heal. Exactly. A resounding no. It says to be charged with supernatural power. If, we, if you all remember the session of Ephesians chapter 5, we spoke about how to go about doing that. What did we speak about? It is actually related to the presence of the Lord. How is one, how is one filled with the Holy Spirit? This is a question that is also very confusing in, in the church also. They frequently say we be filled with the Holy Spirit, but they don't know what it is. And people grasp and smoke. In chapter 5, we spoke about what it was, what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. What did it mean? For those of you who are here in chapter 5, act, exactly. Acknowledge, be, conscious, be, be consciously aware of the Holy Spirit in you. If for those of you who can't, can't remember, you can refer to, to, to chapter 5, the session of chapter 5. We broke it down and we actually showed that to be filled with the Spirit is to walk in conscious awareness of the Holy Spirit in you and around you. This is what Peter actually um, was doing. He was consciously aware of the Holy Spirit and when he prayed for boldness, it the place shook. Because that he, he was actually moving filled with the Holy Spirit. That is why we mention in Ephesians chapter 5 that Paul says to be drunk with wine is stupidity because to be drunk with mind is to lose control of your mind and to walk in the holy spirit is to actually have control of your mind and walk in conscious awareness of the holy spirit in you and around you but most importantly in you alan you, you actually spot on you say the kingdom of heaven is within you and the kingdom of heaven if you read mark matthew chapter 6 as well as romans chapter 14 it says that the kingdom of heaven and the holy spirit is one and the same so conscious awareness of the kingdom of God in you is conscious awareness of the Holy Spirit in you. So, coming back to verse 10, does that, does that help anyone here? Does that make sense? Is this helping anyone so far? I know it actually what we're doing here is deconstructing the popular church doctrine. Excellent. All right. So here we go. He says, in conclusion, be charged with supernatural power. Draw your strength from him which is your conscious awareness of the Holy Spirit. You're drawing your strength from Him. And be empowered through your union with Him. My goodness. And in the power of His boundless might. I want to just pause and give two minutes on mute and express how this impacts you. Express what this new, what this, for some of, the, for some of you this may be a new understanding. How does this understanding help you here? Feel free to unmute and, 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 and express. Just two minutes, guys. Just unmute. Anyone? Bro, Elijah, if, if you want, instead of writing, you could unmute and, 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 and let me know. Well, I'll be brave. Uh -huh. um, 
the church that I used to go to, this stuff does not exist. What we're talking about is is a foreign language, but um, I, I believe, and I'm and I'm I'm seeking. What does the scripture say? To um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I'm doing that. There are people, there are Christian saints around me. Most of you people probably can hear the Holy Spirit. I can't really hear him. I think I'm starting to hear him a little bit. I can't see in the spirit. I'm, I'm still striving for that. So yeah. I'm at a different level than you guys are probably like way beyond me. But we're heading to the same kingdom anyway, you know. So yeah. so what we're talking about tonight, it's all good and it's all true. <laughs> it's, it's all scripture. So praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. And Alan, actually, all of the things that you're mentioning there is not just, actually, I just want to encourage you here and actually let you know that um, if we actually scripturally break it down, you'd realize that the things that you say that you're like hearing the Holy Spirit and seeing in the Spirit, you, you actually operate with it. Just that it has not been taught in a manner where it may be understandable you to understand that that is what you actually have and that is and the things that and that is what you may need you actually need to, to identify and work with but you have it already right yeah, I'm, I'm, it's like you said earlier i'm trying i'm trying to get rid of that i'm trying to get that single mindedness not that double mindedness because i was taught this stuff never existed so now that's where my mind is working against what i was taught you know awesome awesome yeah thank awesome. you brother no problem bro anybody else Let's unmute quickly before we proceed. We're gonna deconstruct the rest of the armor. I guess. Come on, guys, don't be shy, don't be bashful. This is a, 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 uh, Zin. Uh huh. Just to express my thoughts here. Um, from the last session, understanding that the power of God actually flows through the acknowledgement of the kingdom of God, which is the city. The spirit of God inside of us, as well as outside of us and around us. I think that, um, in my experience now, for for the past week, um, things have been a lot smooth, a lot smoother than it was before. Just by from Ephesians five, understanding the um, the acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit, right? And this comes in now to tie back in. Exactly what we're reading here in six, right? Understanding that our our God given right, or I should say um culture is to go behind the enemy and driving them out and establishing righteousness. And I believe once we acknowledge the Holy Spirit, once we continue to acknowledge the Holy Spirit and live in his presence, this will continue to be um smooth. For us, as Indeed. well as um, removing all difficulty and actually, as you said, deconstructing the religious concepts. Because actually, um, just by just by acknowledging the Holy Spirit, that is something entirely different from the religious views. You understand? Because you are now experiencing it for yourself. All right. So let's move on. So we see here that to, to be strong in the Lord is to be empowered in the Lord and to be empowered is the Greek word is in dunamo which is actually a variation of the Greek word dunamis which means to be empowered means to be charged with supernatural miraculous power in the Lord draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him right here from Miriam Wim selection here we have the definition of empower means to be to enable to give official authority or legal power to Jesus already did that for you and to promote the self actualization or influence of right we know that we are not actually self actualizing here what we are actually doing is actually acknowledging the influence in this case right if we if well when we say when I say we let me just be clear on that when we say self actualization we're not actualizing your Adamic self actualization not um, in reference to not Applying that to your old old man thinking, the old nature, the mind of the old man, the Adamic man, or the fallen Adamic man, but self actualization would be would, could could be applied now to your new nature in Christ, embracing who you are, right? Or as you see here, to promote self actualization or influence of. 
influence here meaning the um, the the influence of the Holy Spirit right, upon and through you. Right? This is what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. To be led, uh, Paul says in Romans, to be led. Those, are, those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. So that should be very clear. Empower, be charged. And we charge, we walk filled with the Holy Spirit according to Ephesians chapter 5. Is to actually walk in conscious awareness of the Holy Spirit in you, flowing through you. This, as, as we covered before, this is what prayer is about. Prayer is not to get you closer to God. You are already as close to God as you can get for all eternity. Prayer, according to Hebrews 11, 6, says those who pray must believe. There's actually prayer increases your conscious awareness of God. Just like a relationship. The more you speak to your spouse, you increase your awareness of your spouse. You are more conscious of your spouse. You are more attentive to your spouse. Likewise, prayer functions in the same capacity. So, it says, be empowered in the Lord. It also says, um, be empowered through your union with Him and in the power of His boundless might. The word power there is the Greek word kratos. It means vigor. It also means strength, dominion. Right? So be empowered in the Lord and the strength of his in, in the dominion of in his dominion. In the, actually the King James says be, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If we put in the definitions that we're looking at here now as we break it down, we're saying be charged with power in the Lord. Be charged with dunamis in the Lord. Be empowered in the Lord and in the dominion of his strength. And the word strength is the Greek word iskus, uh, that means forcefulness. Right? Be empowered in the Lord and in the dominion of his strength, the dominion of his forcefulness. Does that make sense? Is this making sense? Just indicate yes, lovely, awesome. Nice. So verse 11. Would anyone read verse 11 for me, please? Well, actually, no. My my bad. I would actually, since John read out verses 10, 17 already, I will read verse 11 and we'll go straight into it. It says, put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of heavily armed soldier, so that ye may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and strategies and deceit of the devil. Right now, it is because of this verse that the popular church doctrine has actually took it, taken the armor and made it defensive. But now from the offensive perspective, we realize that the same verse means has a totally different um, outlook on it. So we identify that the contextual approach of the armor of God is righteousness, um, search and destroy, eliminate oppression. Now question, with regards to of being in the military, since we're speaking about the armor of God and the armor is for battle, for war, with regards to, to being in the military, what is the purpose of a soldier's uniform or an armor? We already identified it for war, but in the military, what purpose does armor or the soldier's uniform serve? Rank, excellence, awesome. Awesome. John, uh, yes, it also, John is actually for protection, but I was actually narrowing into in the military itself, apart from the, the um, just, um, apart from the, the protective aspect of the armor, which is for your, for your being, and the context of the armor of God, according to Isaiah 59, where Paul quotes this from, for aggression against the enemy, the, in the military in itself, the uniforms, are actually to, to actually identify um, ranks, right? So here we have a definition of uniform by Miriam Webster again. A dress of a distinctive design or fashion worn by members of a particular group and serving as a means of identification, right? Distinctive or characteristic clothing. Now, how? Question. Another question. Yes, Alan, we are all soldiers. But what we're going to do here is identify 
the armor of God. That's what we want to identify here. So, next question. Listen up. How does the military differentiate its officials? In the army, how does the military differentiate its officials? Or to be more specific, how does the military differentiate the various ranks of the army? Isn't it by insignia? Identifiable insignia. Yes. Emblems. Yes, Elijah. Titles. Medals. Yes, John. Medals are also involved. But in the army, what, yes, they actually, the medals will be part of the insignia. So insignia is defined as a distinguishing mark or sign or badge of authority or honor. Now, another question. Listen up. If we are wearing the armor of God, what would we need to know to be able to effectively operate in the full capacity of the uniform or the armor that you are wearing? Generally, what would we need to know about God's armor, the armor that is available to us, which is the armor of God? What do we need to know about the uniform in itself in regards to what we are discussing here to be able to identify how to effectively operate in the full capacity of the position that that armor belongs to wouldn't we need to identify its insignia yes, yes uh, Alan its strength but in, it's its strength in the context of rank in context of military rank and position does that make sense to everyone yeah everybody following that so if you're using God's armor then you need to know what is the insignia or the emblems the medals on God's armor that comes with God's armor. Now, where in scripture, where in scripture can we find that? Anybody familiar with that? It's in the Bible. Think. Where in the Bible can we find the rank of the armor of God? As I said, we're looking at this from the analogical perspective as well as the literal perspective. So, this is the literal perspective, the actual armor. Come on, at least guess. At least guess. <laughs> Think about it. Ephesians 6. But well, Ephesians 6, Elijah, mentions the armor, right? But what we want to do is actually identify the insignia or the rank of the armor so we know how to, um, what is the title or the capacity of the armor that you're wearing so you know how to operate in it, right? So, so far, Isaiah, where Paul quoted his armor from, identifies that it is offensive and for the sake of vengeance against the devil. Acknowledging righteousness. We can find it in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Could I ask my brother Elijah to read this for me, please? Yeah, sure. Um, Joshua. Uh, Joshua. Uh, which chapter, uh, brother? Chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. If, if you want to relate, if you actually want to look at it in the chat, that's, that, that's okay too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Joshua, uh, chapter 5, 13 to uh, 15, Amplified Bible. So now when Joshua was by Jericho, he looked up and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his uh, drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversary, uh, adversaries? And he said, No, rather I have come uh, now as captain uh, of the army of the Lord. And then Joshua uh, fell with his face toward the earth and bowed down and said to him, uh, what does my Lord have to say to this to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet because the place where you are standing is holy. Amen. Set apart or set apart to the Lord. Uh, and Joshua did, did so. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my holy brother. So, scripturally, what is the rank of the armor of God mentioned in Ephesians? From this excerpt, what is the rank? Captain, 
excellent. Yes, it is. So if we are using the armor of God, from what perspective are we supposed to address the enemy in union with the Lord Jesus? If we are using the armor of God, from what perspective do we aggress the enemy? Come on guys, don't be so quiet. Don't be so quiet now. <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> fire, fire, fire indeed. As captain, exactly. As captain. Which means, here is something to ruffle popular church doctrine. If we are putting on the armor of God and the armor is the armor of the captain of the Lord, of the Lord's army, the Lord's hosts, should we be asking angels to protect us? No, we should not. And we will explain that, but we will explain why as we are coming, on, coming into the rest of the armor. But as the captain, shouldn't you be leading the army? Yes, Alan, we give them orders. Lovely. I'll give you a high five for that, bro. <laughs> we give, Alan in particular here, we give, we give them orders. I'll give you a high five for that. That is exactly what we are supposed to be doing. For more information on that, please refer to Hebrews chapter 1. You are in union with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 is about Jesus and his military, pos his military uh, position and rank. If when you read that, the same Christ that you're reading about is the same Christ in you. You share that chapter with Jesus. Does that make sense? Everybody seeing that? So we see that the armor of God is the armor of the military rank of the Lord, which is you are operating from the perspective of the captain of the host. Making sense? No. Now, just to give you some additional information, it says the captain of the host. What is a host? Thank you very much, John. What is a host? Benedict is the commander of the host that reports to me. Heaven, yeah, okay. What is a host? Oh. Here, actually, I want um, my aunt Adrian just posted a, a, a little chart that I that that that, that is um, that is there. I want you all to open that chart. I just want to actually give you all a little insight into the army that you're leading here now this is actually a basic military or uh, army structure from the actually in particular the u.s army right you'll notice that at the bottom of the structure you notice that the army is actually how the army is structured the supplied in squads three to four squads equals a platoon three to four platoons equals a company three to five companies each equal equals a battalion Three or more battalions, um, sorry, three or more battalions equals a brigade. Three brigades are necessary for division, and two to five divisions are necessary for cause. And two cores constitute an army. Everybody seeing that? Everybody seeing that? All right, lovely. How many of us is actually familiar with Hebrews chapter 12? If I am not mistaken, just let me pull that up. It says we are gathered unto the Lord. Therefore, Hebrews 12, 1. King James Version. I read it from the King James Version in particular. Let's take a look at this so you can have, have an idea as to the, the army that is that you are actually leading. It says wherefore, see you also compare this now. Just now. Give me one second here. Let me pull it up. Maybe mistaken concerning where it is taken from. So just let me pull it out here. All right, that's Hebrews 12.22. All right, so this is the authorized version. I'm just post that there. Here we are, guys. Take a look at this. Mark, could you read that for me, please? Hebrews 12.22. You there? Mark may have stepped away. Okay. Um, but ye are come unto Mount, Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable, the innumerable company of angels. Thank you very much, my holy brother. Now, question: In the structure that I actually sent to you, 
how much does it take to make a company to, con to constitute a company how much does it take four battalions four platoons four platoons three to four platoons which is actually 100 to 200 soldiers everybody's seeing that everybody's seeing that 100 to 200 soldiers now look at hebrews 12 22 how many angels constitute a company innumerable right excellent so now i will leave you all, leave you all to do the math with respect to what is one army in heaven and actually in the old testament it says the lord of hosts which means to say armies plural do the math i'll leave that for you all <laughs> right so coming back everybody seeing that right nicely all right so we're back back at verse 12 right actually you can look at he second samuel 6 2, 6 2 and it actually says lord of hosts it's, it's all over the bible second, second samuel 6 2 will help you out with that so verse 12 it says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood contending only with physical opponents but against rulers against the powers against the force world forces of this present darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places right the word powers Sorry, again, the first rulers, but, but against the rulers, the words rulers in the King James Version actually trans also translated the principalities. Right? That's the Greek word arche, that means rank, place, and also in reference to a captain. Yeah? All right? Sorry, not, not, not captain, but um, prince. So we're actually referring to Ephesians 6.12. You can also look at Ephesians 6.12 in the Amplified Classic Version. It actually calls the principalities despotisms meaning princes a despot um alan acts dark army technically alan because actually um the satanic satan is actually a fallen angel a fallen a yeah, fallen one so he is actually referred to as a prince prince of the powers of the air or prince of darkness which actually refers to him yes in a military position um, if you read Daniel chapter 9, it actually refers to Jesus as the Prince of Princes. So in union with Christ, he has no choice but to obey. As I mentioned earlier on, he is not an enemy. You are the Prince of Princes and he is a Prince. So you give him instructions. You reinforce it in the, in the, from the captain's perspective. Right? A despot, it's actually, as I mentioned, principalities is actually referred to as despot. Prince, yes, Alan, Prince of Persia, that is mentioned in, in um, Daniel. Prince of Persia, the Prince of, uh, also the Prince of, um, Prince of Greece. Yeah. Notice that um, Gabriel actually had to battle through those guys to get to Daniel. Now we are seated on the throne, so we are not below those princes anymore. We are above them. Right. So as I mentioned, principalities actually in in King James in the Amplified Classic Version is also referred to as despotisms. Uh, despot is a ruler with absolute power and authority, tyrannically, which means to say the, the, the princes of darkness that is being referred to as principalities here. Well, principality means the area of which, over which a prince rules, hence principality. We know that by this explanation that Paul is given here, that the princes of darkness, they are not benevolent. They are tyrants. So it's important that we, in, 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 um, in establishing the kingdom that we take the captain's perspective when it actually when when dealing with those with, with those um despotisms those principalities right all remember king the daniel daniel 9 refers to jesus as the prince of princes never forget that all right powers principalities and powers it was powers there is actually the greek word exousia that also means privilege force capacity Right, power. World forces is the actually Greek word cosmo cosmophator. That means a world ruler, which is usually an epithet, as you see there, of Satan, according to the concordance. And spiritual wickedness would be pneumaticos, meaning non carnal, ethereal, or dem demoniacally speaking, a spirit. Right? Our uh, could um up uh, uh just some additional information here the spiritual the nine spiritual gifts that we operate with of the holy spirit are also called pneumaticos 
So if you actually understand what pneumaticos is, is actually spiritual manifestation, then spiritual wickedness in high places would be spiritual manifestation of wickedness. Does that make sense to, um, to everyone? It's the same thing. Right? I'm actually just read through those because we already covered them in the previous chapters. All right, lovely. Verse 13, it says, Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, and victorious. So let's see, let's see how the Apostle Paul advises that you do that. Kelly, your mic is on. Kelly, your mic is unmuted. Just kindly mute it for me, please. Thank you. So let's see how Paul actually says this. He's, he goes on to say in verse 14, So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, and having put on the blessed spirit of righteousness and upright heart. The King James Vision reads, Stand therefore having your loins girt about the truth and having on the blessed spirit of righteousness. The word loins is the Greek word osphos. We spoke about this in, a, in, a, in the chapter before. It is actually literally means your loins, the external loins, which would be genitals. And um, figuratively, it refers to your procreative power, right? Your procreative power. So it says, stand there for having your procreative power. Where is your procreative power? We mentioned this is found in First Peter chapter 1. It says, to, to good the loins of your mind meaning the mind the greek word mind there being imagination meaning good the procreative power of your imagination where to the saints we covered this so let's see how much we remember to the saints what where is their spiritual sight your physical eyes are your physical sight where is your spiritual sight to the saints we cover this in Ephesians chapter 1. Come on, guys. Go back into the imagination. imagination. The imagination. The eyes of your imagination. That was found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. The eyes of your understanding is actually the eyes of your dianoia, meaning the eyes of your imagination. So, so, when he says here, stand therefore, having your loins, According to the definition, figuratively, we know that he is actually referring to a procreative force, which is in the eyes of your imagination. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. What is he saying? Simply that the eyes of your imagination must be disciplined according to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is emphasized by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, when he says, to cast down your imaginations and to what else cast down your imaginations and what else second corinthians 10 chap chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 what does it say not and to bring every thought captive to the obedience of christ exactly so you cast down your imaginations and bring every thought into the obedience of christ it simply means that the eyes of the imagination of the saints should not be roaming in dark things does that make sense what your physical, I said this in chapter 1, what your physical eyes is to your physical body, your, the eyes of your imagination is to your spirit man, is to your spiritual, is, is your spiritual sight. So it is very important for the saints to have a disciplined thought life. Should a, should, should a saint be thinking about being attacked by demons? Should a saint be thinking about being attacked by demons? No. Resoundingly, no. Because that is not true. If a, if a devil cannot attack Jesus, the devil cannot attack the saints. Your, the, what, your um, girding your loins or your procreative force of imagination with false information leaves actually will bring it into reality. So, simply put, the devil will, should not, will not be able to attack you unless you believe that the devil can, can attack you. Yes, Alan? Attacking the mind. 
yeah so to, so we understand to stand there for having your loins girt about with truth it means discipline thought life keep your thought life in truth the truth of the kingdom of jesus christ does that make sense everybody following that yeah nice and the word good as my aunt just posted there means to good all around to fasten one on one's belt meaning keep your mind very disciplined in the kingdom do not allow it to roam in untruth it's very important that the saints actually understand the scripture to do this saved heal no lack it yes john yes all right that's this is where the renewal of the mind come in so if one is told to gird your procreative power with truth then we know that this is reference to controlling your mind a disciplined thought life or disciplined eyes of the imagination therefore we understand that part of the armor is strictly standing or immovably applying truth to the eyes of the imagination or to the screen of the mind which is his procreative kingdom power does that make sense the mind of the saints has been enlightened by the holy spirit in other words if we entertain untruthful thoughts or lies then we create our own darkness the saint must have a disciplined thought life fight it with scriptures alan that is so profound in the book of proverbs king solomon actually says have an answer for temptation jesus's knowledge of king solomon's works actually would have motivated him in the wilderness in the 40 days to actually have an answer for the temptations that he identified that all men would go through lack of food lack of money as well as lack of supernatural manifestation always have an answer for temptation follow jesus does that make sense king solomon says that in the book of proverbs always have an answer for temptation so wherever you're struggling it'll be recommended that you go search the bible find out find, find that scripture and reinforce your mind in that area always answer it with that scripture just like jesus did nice the bless also he says to having on the breastplate of righteousness psalm 103 verse 6 brings this into context it says the breastplate of righteousness in in ephesians psalm 103 verse 6 says as you see as you see there my hand posted breastplate of righteousness actually is a representation of equity and justice Psalm 103 verse 6 says the Lord executes righteousness again another indication that the armor of God if it is righteousness is not defensive it is offensive executes righteousness and justice for all the oppressed so the saints in union with and empowered by the Lord the saints must execute righteousness and justice for all that were oppressed Jesus did exactly that Acts 10 38 some read, someone read Acts 10 38 for me, please. Acts 10 38. It's right in the chat box. It's right in the chat, chat box. Just read Acts 10 38 for me, please. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with great power. And he went around uh, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Awesome. Thank you, my holy brother awesome amen so we see that jesus actually went about it was jesus using righteousness in this case was jesus using righteousness as um a defense trying to walk right which is the popular church doctrine try to walk in righteousness at all times righteousness has nothing to do with that righteousness here is actually just as jesus he went around right went around went around doing good do you know that the word went around doing good in the Greek actually means he wandered around doing good? Jesus was not waiting for a special leading. He wandered about doing good. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. When it says he went around doing good, in the Greek text, the word went around actually means wandered. He went about doing good, seeking the oppressed to set them free 
offense since offense whenever yes alan wherever he saw the need right is is this is this helping you all bring the armor into its proper context is this helping you all bring the armor into its, into its context yeah awesome verse 15 and having on having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news now in the previous sessions chap or the chapters the first five chapters we identified two contexts of peace in relation to Paul's letter. The first one was peace by military leadership. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 identifies this. It refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Now, one of the translators of the New English translation actually said that this title pictures the king as one who establishes a safe socio-economic environment for his people. It hardly depicts him as a meek individual, for he, for he establishes peace through military strength, as the preceding context and the first two royal titles indicate. His people experience safety and proster, prosperity because the invincible king destroys their enemies. So it is no coincidence that the word peace is actually enjoined with prince. Jesus is the Prince of Princes, and as the Prince of Princes, he is the captain of the Holy Army of God, of the Lord of Hosts. So, when we go, we not only go, yes, yes, we go empowered with the Holy Spirit, but we also have the entire angelic army that we can give directions to lock down an entire area. Since I want you, I want you all to grasp this. It is huge military strength behind you once you step up on that plate to actually um, establish righteousness this you are operating as the captain of the army you sort of a company alone is innumerable and jesus is called the prince of peace which means he establishes peace and prosperity safety by military strength is this is this is this bringing it is, is that is that is that does that help you yeah excellent everybody following that is excellent great and the second context will be peace between jews and gentiles which was covered in ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 12. we would not reiterate that but paul actually preached that he was preaching the gospel of peace between jews and gentiles by removing the removing of the law code of the previous covenant making jews and gentiles all one in christ one new man you all remember that you can actually refer to the scripture there for that all right verse 16 says above all lift up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one now let's divulge into why you do not need the armor really to protect you as the popular church doctrines actually use we know as we just identified that this reference that paul is using is analogical it's an analogy but regarding the shield of faith there are also mechanical facts that you can find in the scripture that should be taken into considering into, into consideration considering faith as a shield how many of us are familiar with the fact i asked this question before but let's ask the question again that psalms 84 verse 11 actually refers to says that the lord god is a sun and shield everybody seeing that everybody seeing that the lord god is a sun and shield now you might ask why am i making reference to this it ties in tighter than a nut and bolt so let's look at it here we see the lord god is a sun and shield notice that it says sun and shield sun and shield here are being paralleled sun and shield parallels they mean the same thing in this context are we seeing that the lord god is a sun and he's a shield it is a parallel everybody seeing that sun and shield parallel yeah excellent come on guys just let me know that you all are following just indicate yes or unmute say yes everybody else everybody's following all right okay so we have alan and elijah saying yes so here we see that parallel taking place sun and shield walking into grace thank you 
So from this verse, we understand that the Lord God is a son. And being a son is his shield. Or the Lord God being a shield is a son. So let's get a little more specific. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. It says, um, Kelly, if you're there, could you read Revelation 1 16 in chat window, please? Can I ask Kelly if she's here? Kelly, are you there? Kelly Key. All right, she probably has stepped away. Hello? Ah, here, you know. In his right hand, he held the seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment, and his face, reflecting his majesty and the Shekinah glory, glory was like the sun shining in all its power at midday. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sister. All right. So how many of us actually familiar with this verse? I'm sure well, everybody should have read through Revelation, right? That's the most sought after in time book. So how many know that the word power in this verse is actually dunamis? That's a question again. The word power at midday is the word dunamis. What are you following that? Yeah? So, that would read, in his right hand he held seven stars and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment and his face reflecting his majesty and his Shekinah glory was like the sun shining in all its dunamis. Now this is the same dunamis that means ability or miraculous power. Therefore, we see that the the Yes, John. <laughs> yes. Therefore, we see that the shining of the sun, in this case, is the sun's dunamis. Where are we going with this? So let's tie it in. By integrating the understanding of, the understanding of Psalms 84, 11, which says the Lord God is our sun and shield, and Revelation 1, 16, the shining of the sun is its dunamis, we can see that the shining light of the sun is its power, its dunamis. And the shining light of the sun in related to 8411, Psalm 8411, is its shield, its protective shield. Can anyone approach the sun, brothers and sisters, without being incinerated or consumed? Can anyone approach the sun without being incinerated or consumed? So well, now, NASA will come to a quick realization, John, don't worry. <laughs> yes, Alan, in spirit, but we actually referring to the physical sun here. Physical sun. The sun that is actually the star of our solar system. Can anyone approach the sun, even though NASA thinks they can do it, and they will come to a starting realization? Exactly. You can't approach the sun without being consumed or incinerated. So isn't the rays of the sun its shield? Yes, it is. Indeed. So the rays of the sun is functioning as a shield. So if Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, how many of us are familiar with the fact? We mentioned this before. Malachi 4 2 calls Jesus a son of righteousness. S-U-N. You write that in there. Son of righteousness. You all remember that? We covered that in, the previous, in, in one of the sessions in, in the previous chapters. Malachi 4 2 calls Jesus a son of righteousness. Yes. Excellent, excellent. So, likewise, <clears throat> the reception of the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, makes us like Father God and our elder brother Jesus Christ. Do you know that that also makes us sons and shields, like Father, like Son, made in image and likeness? Do you realize that that makes us sons and shields? Holy Spirit in us functions as the Spirit of Father, which is the Spirit of Power and the Spirit of Son and Shield. I want, you, I want that to settle into your mind. The Holy Spirit being the Spirit of Light and the Spirit of Power is our shield. So if we are a son, can unholiness or evil approach us? Come on, guys. Come on. Yes. No, excellent. No, it cannot. Everybody following that? I know this shakes a lot of doctrine because we are taught that in a popular church doctrine that you need angels to protect you. 
but actually Father has made you self-protective by giving you his spirit. To shine like a sun in his spirit run. And darkness cannot approach you. Just like darkness, not just like um one cannot approach our physical sun. Star in the sky that we call the sun. Without being incinerated. So because of the Holy Spirit in you, darkness cannot approach you. As a matter of fact, the psalm says that the enemies of the Lord melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Anybody familiar with that? Enemies of the Lord melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Now do you understand its context? Does that bring it into context? We are made in the image and likeness of God, much like Jesus, by his Holy Spirit. So, to lift up the shield of faith, according to Philemon 1 verse 6, that says that the communication of our faith be made effective and powerful by the acknowledging of what Jesus Christ has done in us, then we know to lift up the shield of faith is to live in the awareness of this mechanical fact of Christ in you. Does that make sense? Kindly unmute and give your feedback on this. It should shift your paradigm. Unmute. Alan, feel free to unmute instead of writing and just... Which part, Alan? Somebody closed the door outside my window. I couldn't... What were you asking? I'm sorry. Oh, I was asking. Um, it says just to lift up the shield of faith. According to Philemon 1 verse 6, it says that the communication of your faith, or the release of your faith, is um, be made effective and powerful by acknowledging the, every good thing that Christ has done in you. So in essence, what it says, what it means is to act, to walk in the active, to actively walk in this understanding is to walk in the conscious awareness of it and the acknowledgement of it. So now that we have explained this as we being sons and shields, what I was was what I was asking is for everyone, for anyone to unmute and express how this on this on this this information helps you, because we've been well, taught differently. To me, I mean, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're like little Jesuses. Exactly. If I can respectfully say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anybody else? This should shift your paradigm so that you know that you do not need angels to protect you. You need angels to actually help deliver and set oppressive. Your pressure, your oppressed, your, those that are oppressed free. You give them directions. And Father is spirits. Spirit. Yes, sir. Exactly. Ministering spirits. So in Christ, we are sons and shields, just like Father. So to walk, to actually lift up the shield of faith is to simply have faith in one thing alone. Christ in you. The Holy Spirit in you. Walk in conscious awareness of Christ in you or the, or the Holy Spirit in you and acknowledge this simple mechanical fact. Does that make sense? Any comments? Any feedback on that? All right, so let me just reinforce it with some scientific information here. Do you know that it's scientifically proven that the rays of the sun is electricity on a different radio frequency, which means to say it is energy, hence the generation of the sun's heat. It is electricity, electricity on a different frequency. Power, yes, John, right? Much like from the astronomical perspective, our sun gives light to the earth, and no one can approach the sun without being consumed. So God is a sun and his rays, his light, his shine is his shield. And anything that attempts to approach God that is unholy will be consumed. That is why he told Moses in the wilderness, do not come close. Because Moses was of the spirit of Adam. The inhabitants of planet Earth feel the heat of the sun on the Earth's surface. The more altitude one gains on the Earth, Physically, the greater the experience of its heat. This is the effect of the sun at a distance of 149,600,000 kilometers or 92,900,000 miles from the earth. We feel its heat and its power, its dunamis, from that distance. Imagine then if Revelation 1, 21, 23 reads... And the city has no need of the sun nor of the moon to give light to it. For the glory of God has illumined it. And the Lamb, the Lamb, which is Christ Jesus, is its lamp and light. Here we see, we can safely conclude that in our union with Christ, in Christ we shine throughout the universe. And our light is our shield. If the sun doesn't turn off, we don't turn off. 
the only impediment here, brothers and sisters, is not acknowledging this and having faith in it. In other words, your only impediment in experiencing this is unbelief. Does this make sense? Yeah? Which means, in acknowledging this, you should walk into any neighborhood and devils should be running because the Son of Righteousness is present. If you read Malachi 4 2, it says the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Your presence alone in acknowledging this would heal people. I testify to this in Adventist in Identity, Adventist in identity, in identity Testimonials where earlier on this year I actually sat down in the ward of a hospital with my girlfriend's younger son and by acknowledging this seated in the ward by the end of the by the end of the day at by six o'clock the entire ward was this was actually dismissed people recovered and went home i was just sitting in one room on the entire floor and the entire floor was dismissed yeah for those of you who are we hearing this for the first time this is not this is not just doctrine this is very real acknowledge it test it and you will see it works <clears throat> right finally verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god All right so there are two contexts in which we can look at the statement regarding the helmet of salvation the context of deliverance as well as the context of life in christ the former context which is deliverance is rooted in isaiah 59 if you read Isaiah 59, as we read it, we, men we mentioned the helmet of salvation was actually the helmet of a salvation towards um, delivering the oppressed, having a mindset to deliver the oppressed. I'm saying that again. The helmet of salvation in this context, according to Isaiah 59, is a context regarding delivering the oppressed, having a mindset to set people free, and also for life in Christ. Or, as you see here, um, in Isaiah 59, vengeance and indignation, offense against oppression. Concerning life in Christ, the helmet serves as a purpose in the context of war. So it protects the head, the brain, which in this analogical context will refer to the mind. From what would, from what, from what would we need to protect our minds? Simply, unbelief. The saint must live in constant awareness of his salvation. Question. What justifies the saint in Christ? Just like some people actually feel confident and bold because they have money, a nice car, or a big house. What in Christ justifies us in that context? What justifies us in this context? Alan, we're coming to that verse. That's a, that is a verse as... oh. Excellent. We're coming to that verse. Hold on to that. In Christ, just like in the world, those in Adam who actually feel bold and strong and confident because they have riches or possessions, what justifies us in that context in Christ? Is it um, our position? What gave you the position? What purchased the position for you? Christ's blood. The blood of Jesus, exactly. So when you are feeling uncertain, remind yourself of the blood of Jesus. That is your I, that is your justification. Remind yourself that Jesus shed the blood and proceed with boldness and with strength in conscious awareness of the Spirit in you. Guys, are we, are we making sense with this? Just some sin that again, just as the those in Adam feel bold and walk with very high ego because of possessions and money. We in Christ walk in boldness in Christ because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus that was shed to actually make it possible for us to walk into the Holy of Holies as is stated in Hebrews. Right? Yes, Allah. Right? It's actually what purchased your position in Christ. Everything that you have in Christ is because of the blood of Jesus. That is your redemption in your hand. So anytime you feel unbelief, like 
if you're struggling, if you like you're struggling to believe, remember the blood of Jesus and attack with full force. Be empowered, motivated because of the blood of Jesus. That is your house, that is your riches, that is your car. <laughs> that is your redemption in Christ. Um, yes, walking into grace it is. Right? Verse, right? That is also that is Hebrews 10 19. It says, Therefore, believers, since we have confidence and full freedom to enter the holy place by means of what? The blood of Jesus. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame and conquered him because of what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Is this clear? Is, is anyone confused? Is anyone uncertain? Double-minded at this moment. If you are, please feel free to unmute. Let's clarify it immediately. All right. Lovely. Verse 18. It says, With all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion. Wait. Oh, my, my bad. I skipped the, the sword of the Spirit. Um, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the Word, word of God, everybody is actually familiar with Jesus as the Word in, in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, which is actually the Greek word logos. The Word of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 is actually rhema of God. The word rhema actually means the utterance of God. For those of you who did basic identity 1, I actually identify that your new identity is Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of Christ. So when we say sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is actually you speaking, as Paul put it, as Peter put it, sorry, you speak as the oracles of God, which means to say you speak as God, you speak in the place of God, you speak as God. Does that make sense? For those of you who did identity one, we covered that. We, 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 we went to scriptures that actually show that even Peter, Paul, and Jesus, they spoke in the, in the, from the perspective of the Spirit of God, as the oracles of God. Um, um, Alan posted Revelation 1.16, which also says the same thing in different words. It says, in his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp edged sword of judgment. It also says, um, in, in Jesus' left, in Jesus' message to the churches, he tells them, I will come against you with the sword of my mouth. And at the end of it, he says, those who hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, which identifies that Jesus is speaking as the Spirit of God. This is very instrumental in your walk in Christ. Your new spirit is the spirit of Christ, it is the spirit of God. So you, just as Jesus exemplified in Revelation in his letter to the, to, to, to the seven churches, he spoke it, identified himself, and then ended it by saying, this is what the spirit says to the churches. So he was speaking from the perspective of the spirit of God. In like fashion, we speak from that perspective, and when we speak from that perspective, it is effective. It is the sword. Is this making sense? Yeah? All right. For those of you a little bit confused on what I just maybe that briefly divulged in there, you can actually check the basic identity follow up. I I actually went into some lengths to actually show you in the script here where this is present. All right? Um so we're going to also this 18 it says with all prayer and petition, pray with specific specific requests at all times on every occasion and every season. In the spirit, here we go again. In the spirit, or as we put it before, as the spirit. And with with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. Now, First Corinthians 14, verse 2. Paul says for until the journey, you can post 1 Corinthians 14 too for me. He says, For one who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to people but to God. For no one understands him or catches his meaning, but by the Spirit he speaks mysteries. In 1 Corinthians 14, actually, Paul equates speaking in tongues 
as praying in the spirit. Praying in tongues is praying in the spirit. Everybody familiar with that? Praying in tongues is praying in the spirit. Yes. How many of us are familiar with familiar with the fact that that is only understanding that praying in tongues is praying in the spirit was specific? The audience of that letter was were babes in Christ. So to limit tongues to praying in the spirit is actually baby stuff. You know that statement there, rocking a little theology, but I'm, I'm going to show you that Jesus, we covered in this in the identity class, that Jesus prayed in the spirit also, but he didn't pray in tongues. He just didn't, there's no record of Jesus praying in tongues per se, but he prayed in the spirit. And that is identified in John chapter 17, verses 1 to 5, where he prayed from so the would, perspective. Huh? So would you say then praying in tongues is like um the baby steps to crawling while to walking? You know, like when an infant is learning to walk, they crawl and then they hold on. And Would you say that praying in tongues then is like a, um, a stepping stone? All right, so... So let me ask this question. This will bring it in, into perspective. The nine gifts of the Spirit, doesn't the Apostle Paul call them the manifestations of the Spirit? Everybody can answer this yeah. question. All right, so they refer to the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. What is required from the perspective of identity? If you are manifesting something, does that not refer to your nature? Yeah, it does. Which means... That when you're praying in tongues, who are you praying as? What are the you praying? The Holy Spirit. Exactly. So for babes in Christ who are actually now coming into Christ, they are actually struggling with their carnal mind or the carnal mindset. Jesus, being the mature saint that we are actually trying to mature and be like, in John 17 verses 1 to 5, prayed in the Spirit, but then pray in tongues. He prayed from the perspective of the, of his father's spirit. And you'll notice in verse 3, my aunt just posted it there. In verse 3, he actually identified Jesus Christ in the third person. So if he identified Jesus, his soul, in the third person, who is he praying as? All oh, right. He was praying as the Holy Spirit then. Exactly. He's praying from the perspective of the Spirit of God. That is why he says, No, Father, glorify me together with yourself in verse 5. With the glory and majesty that I had with you before the world existed. He's praying from that perspective. Is this making sense to everyone? So the praying in tongues is actually to get you started into accepting your identity. After that, you should progress from tongues into using your soul, your renewed mind, to pray from the perspective of the Spirit. This is what Paul referred to in Ephesians, uh, sorry, in 1 Corinthians 14 when he said, tongues will cease. Do you, remember, do you all remember that? He was speaking to babes. They had to mature. They had to grow up. I mean? remember that. This is Alan. Uh -huh. um, uh, but I, I am still struggling with, with being able to pray in tongues. I still haven't, I still struggle with the infilling versus there doesn't have to be an infilling because when I got saved, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit. I think I'm still dealing with that carnal, with that, with the, with the teaching that I was taught from the church I used to go to. That's just really messing me up. You know what I'm trying to say? But Alan, actually, at the end of this session, if you wish, I can take about five, five to ten minutes, and I will clear that up and make it very clear for you. Thank you. If I you would have very much appreciate it, brother. All right. Cool. Excellent. We will do that. All right. So everybody following that? Does this make sense? Excellent, excellent. All right, so verses 19 to 24, I, where this is Paul actually wrapping up. So could I ask for one more volunteer? And this brings us to the end of this session. There is, well... I'll do it. No problem. So verses 19. And pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation, for which I am an ambassador and in chains, and pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly and courageously as I should. Now, so that you may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. 
I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and that he may comfort and encourage and strengthen your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and sisters, and love joined with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying and incorruptible love. Thank you very much. Bless you. You're welcome. All right. So that now brings us to the end of the Ephesians series and study. Um, is my is our awesome sister Diana available to read it? The last chapter in a, in the message translation. Ephesians six one. Children, do what your parents tell you. This is only right. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it, namely, so you will live well and have a long life. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Servants, respectfully obey your earthly masters, but, with, but always with an eye to obeying the real master, Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants do, doing what God wants you to do. And that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. Good work will get you good pay from the master, regardless of whether you are slave or free. Masters, it's the same with you. No abuse, please, and no threats. You and your servants are both under the same master in heaven. He makes no distinction between you and them. And that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use. So you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. And don't forget to pray for me. Pray that I'll know what to say and have the courage to say it at the right time, telling the mystery to one and all, the message that I, jailbird preacher that I am, am responsible for getting out. Tychicus, my good friend here, will tell you what I'm doing and how things are going with me. He is certainly a dependable servant of the master. I've sent him not only to tell you about us, but to cheer you on in your faith. Goodbye, friends. Love mixed with faith be yours from God the Father and from the Master, Jesus Christ. Pure grace and nothing but grace be with all who love our Master, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. 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 